Mike at it. You know, that's a good topic. Uh, and what was just shared really goes along with what I plan to share um, when I heard the topic. Um, I always wondered why, you know, they called the chapter We Agnostics. And uh, in the 12 and 12, it gives me a hint and it helps me see where I'm at in this continuum and try to, especially as a newcomer, you know, I certainly needed to find out, did all these people that are making all these claims know what they're talking about? Or are they just talking shit? On 28 and the 12 and 12, it defines certain terms that I need to, to know the definitions of if I'm going to proceed in this. And the best definition for me to use in this fellowship is the, the author's definition of what these terms are if I want to get the most out of the book. I know that makes logical sense. The students among us will know what I'm talking about. This is a textbook, you know. So it talks about on 28, it says, people of religion claim to have proof of the existence of God. It says atheists claim to have proof of the non-existence of God. And an atheist, an, an, an agnostic says it can't be proved. So I put that definition up against the litmus test of thousands of meetings that I've gone to in my tenure here. And I've heard people claim, and only in the last seven, six years has this idea of everybody being an atheist and how cool that is come upon the fellowship. You didn't just hear all these people talking about that stuff. Just in the last seven years have you started hearing it. In the last five, really, it's just taken off. So... I've been in all these meetings with all these people that are making all these claims and I've never seen not one single one of them, whether they be on the religious side or the atheist side, come in a meeting and produce any proof whatsoever. That's my point. I'm going to take a look at that. Proof of the non-existence or the existence of God. Because if I don't have that, I'm just talking. Now, then I have my hint of why they called it We Agnostics, because it says it can't be proved. And when I look deep in that chapter, it talks about how I had been relying on a certain kind of proof, and I always came up wanting. In that chapter, it talked about visual proof is the weakest proof. And what I need to be looking for is evidence in my life. So... When I started off sharing, I started talking about what I just heard was sort of like what I was going to share. And I, and I just heard somebody share about something bad happened, something bad happened, something bad happened. But I'm here sober. See, so the evidence is, is that I'm here sober. And I can still be sober through a day of just life, right? Because just because I'm an addict, life's still going to show up. You know, I thought when I got here, I was admitting I was an addict and, and, the, and, the, and the seas were going to part and everything was going to be cool and everybody was going to give me the credit that I deserved. You know, and I go to my grandmom and say, guess what, grandmom, I've got 60 days sober. She says, so what, i got 80 years sober. You know, and then I realize, man, I really don't need credit for doing what I should have been doing my whole life. So the real onus is on me to try to, the best I can, live a glasses half full life, whereas my life before, I always looked for what was wrong. I always looked for the negative. And what I mean by looking for evidence is, and I don't care who you are, hell, I could find something to bitch about today. One of my little uh, gauges on my car was acting a little funny. I could be consumed with that. And I have gotten drunk over less. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. A lot of times it's not the big stuff that trips us up. Or, you know, I could really train myself by coming in here day in and day out over time to try to look for something to be okay about. That life is not all lost. There's hope in this thing. There's something good to look for. Because anybody could find something bad. That's easy. Sometimes it's tough to look for the lessons, especially through a challenge. And I can't tell you how many times I've been through a challenge. Sometimes just say, God, help, help keep me sober today. And sometimes the most effective prayers are the smallest ones and the simplest ones. Because if I say those small and simple prayers and I'm sincere when I say them, they mean a hell of a lot more than ten lines of, of, 
of or, or, orating prayers and fancy stuff or 10 different meditation books and I'm thinking about calling her when I'm done reading, I ain't even thinking about what I'm reading. But if I say, God help keep me sober and I really mean it, that can have more effect than any of that. And I'm talking about simple, God conscious, practical things if you're new. Because how do you navigate this minefield of this spirituality, especially when I come in here with all these old ideas about what God is and what He isn't? Hell, they made me go to church. Hell, but the God of my childhood is still circling the First Baptist Church striking down sinners. And I come in here, and they tell me I get a new conception, and it's so foreign to what I've been trained to do. But I've got to unlearn but I've got to realize that the distance that i got to go is not so far. And these spiritual terms that they said I shouldn't have a problem with, that I should honestly ask myself what they mean to me and not have prejudice against them, maybe I've been dealing with them all along. Faith and worship. What about that? I've had faith, the electricity is in that light switch all my life. Just let the lights go out. And do you go around the house flipping them some bitches? It's because I'm trained, see? I've had faith. There's nothing to be scared of. I just need to embrace worship. I've certainly worshipped drugs, money. I've worshipped a, a person of the opposite sex. So these terms should not be so scary to me. I just have to realize that today, I more worship with how I live than how what I say. How do I live my life? Because it's easy to come in here and talk this stuff for an hour. Some people have had a lot of practice with it. Some people can make it sound really easy. But the real question is, what am I doing the other 23 hours of the day? Because that's where the real trick here is. So when I think about this topic, I think I'm not going to try to produce you any kind of proof either way, nor have I ever seen anybody do it, nor will I ever see anybody do it. But what I have to do is look for evidence of God working in my life. And so far, I have found more evidence that He's working in a positive way in my life than negative because why am I still here this many years later? And if you're new, that should mean something. Because if this was about serving a sentence and being miserable here, I wouldn't still be here. This is about being reasonably happy, having a satisfactory existence, having a not so great understanding at times of God, of my understanding, which the book makes it easy for me. It says I need a loving and all-powerful creator that needs, need, knows neither time nor limitation that wants the best for me. Is that so hard to embrace? What, do you want your God to think you're a fucking asshole and want you to die? I mean, you can have that God if you want. I'm just telling you. What's over the long haul going to work better? The one that the book describes and the one that I've come to know. I've had a spiritual awakening as we go through these steps and I'll pray.